Hello and welcome to our live webinar where today we're talking about important trends that are set to impact the AZ industry. I'm Gemma De Silva and I'll be moderating the webinar. So we have a lot of great content and discussion planned for today and of course um, if we have time we'll also try to answer some of your questions as well so please do submit the questions that are on your mind regarding today's topic and I will monitor those. Uh, and just to let you know that we will send out an email with the webinar recording and additional resources in the coming days, so keep an eye out for that as well. So joining me today is Roderick Bates, Head of Integrated Practice here at Enscape and a former principal at Kieran Timberlake. And we also have a very special guest, John Kays, who is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Interim Director of the School of Art and Design at Helio College of Architecture and Design. So hello to you both, thank you very much for joining us. We're really looking forward to today. Um, with the intros done, I'm just going to hand over to Roderick now and we're gonna get straight into the presentation and we will get started. So away we go. Absolutely, thank you, Gemma, for that introduction. I uh, absolutely appreciate it. And I also just wanna echo uh, your comment about com questions from the audience. Please uh, use the interface and uh, put those in. We'd love to have uh, some engagement. These are some some interesting trends and we uh, obviously feel that the audience probably has some insightful points to make so we want to make sure that those get a proper airing so we're going to get right into it and talk about the trends that we see uh, at Enscape as being really uh, core to what we consider when it comes to developing our product uh, to meet the needs of the AC industry into the future and we keep tra track of a lot of different trends, but obviously technology is one of the main drivers. Really understanding uh, what are the emerging capabilities out there from a technical perspective that we want to be aware of and potentially fold into our product. So one of the biggest things that we've seen, uh, and something I wouldn't say necessarily that caught us off guard because we were an early player in it, is, is essentially XR, extended reality, meaning augmented reality, virtual reality, and, and, um, and the like. And what was interesting about this is that it really took the pandemic from the perspective of, of our customers to kickstart this into something that really became mainstream. Uh, they were always around uh, the periphery they were used within the AC space, but we saw a sudden sea change with our customers. Um, and I think the best way to describe that change is one in which we started to see the requirements for particularly um, augmented reality and virtual reality to actually be written into client contracts. And once you start seeing that, um, you know that change is really afoot. Something else that we've been keeping track of that uh, we see as is really poised to grow is digital twins. And part of the reason we see this potential for growth is that we're seeing almost like the cell phone era, uh, the early cell phone era of digital twins. You know, this is the um, multi-thousand dollar large Motorola cell phone that you need a, a sort of a, a shoulder strap to carry around. And we're starting to see them actually start to trickle down and become uh, may be applicable to more normative uh, designs, and that's something that's really exciting. The other piece uh, that we're keenly aware of as a software tool is about remote collaboration. Uh, we're all in disparate locations, you can probably tell by our, our videos here, um, but we're all collaborating together, sharing ideas, um, you know, putting forth content, um, you know, and trying to design or create something new. And that's all about collaboration tools that really have to work seamlessly within the context of a remote or hybrid work environment. And I think that's a challenge for, for any company, uh, but particularly for a software company. And of course, you can't talk about trends without mentioning the metaverse. Um, you know, for those of us that are into science fiction, um, you know, perhaps uh, this is a, a almost a stale idea. Um, and then I think for other people, they say, well, we're already in the metaverse. You know, I'm in my phone all the time. I'm staring at a screen in, uh, um, during work. Um, you know, if uh, I think as uh, ours, one of our co-CEOs, um, Peter Matev said, you know, if you're an alien looking down on Earth, you'd probably say that people are already in the metaverse. But I think we all realize that it means a little bit something different. Um, if from our perspective at least, and that's really about immersion. And when we think about the opportunities here, one of the things that has us at Enscape most excited right now is, is probably this quote that you see on the left. Um, essentially that you know, the, the bar for design, at least in the metaverse to which great people are experiencing right now is pretty low. And we are really excited to see an opportunity where the types of designs that we uh, see our customers producing in Enscape these amazing architectural designs 
start to make their way into these virtual environments in the metaverse. Um, and when that happens, uh, it'll be incredibly exciting. And I think what's also pretty exciting is that it's not just about an entertainment concept. Uh, we're seeing the metaverse start to events value from a very practical sense. Uh, one of those that caught our attention that perhaps might have some great applicability and really spur a lot of thinking was when the UK's Northern Railroad uh, created basically digital twins, if you will, or metaverse copies of their um, uh, railroad stations and used them to test accessibility for, uh, uh, for people that might be mobility restricted. Um, and they're really a fascinating application of that metaverse concept. Another thing that has us um, really thinking about the future is one in which it's about stewardship um, and an awareness that the performance of the buildings that people are using our software to help design um, are going to have a really significant contribution when it comes to uh, overall environmental impact, really a global consideration. And I think it really hit home for us when we started to look at a lot of the uh, various um, initiatives that are out there to rein in the impact of buildings. Uh, the AIA's 2030 Challenge, Structural Engineers 2050 Challenge, the MEP 2040 Challenge, and the COP 26. So these are all things that are, are truly global. Uh, they're very serious commitments that firms are taking. And what we're finding is that our customers um, are a large majority of the signatories to those various initiatives. So we think about what's critical to our customers. It's apparent that understanding the performance of their projects from an energy and carbon perspective and the impact they have on the environment is a big deal. Um, and that's not just about operations. Uh, we're seeing embodied carbon, or the, the carbon that's wrapped up in the materials themselves are really being pushed to the forefront. It was one sort of a fringe idea uh, is now becoming part of, of mainstream consideration for performance. And part of this idea of, of carbon and building performance going mainstream um, is the trend of it also moving into, sort of, I wouldn't say necessarily down market may not be the right term, but really moving towards residential or small project considerations. Uh, for us, this is enormously exciting for a couple of reasons. One is it means, you know, that this type of thinking really has permeated all facets of the industry. But what's also exciting about that is that there are an enormous number of these small projects out there. Um, in aggregate, have a pretty significant impact. You know, maybe one high rise is, is huge in its own right, um, but there's uh, obviously a far, far larger number of, um, say, residential units in the U.S. and around the world. So when we start to see carbon considerations become something that homeowners, um, people that are renting apartments and things like that care about, um, you know if this trend is really solidified. So as a software um, or producer, one of the key things that we have to be aware of is how our software is actually being used uh, by our customers. And this isn't always an easy thing to keep track of, um, but we do look to the larger industry trends to understand what's, what's the new normal? What is the way in which people are utilizing software within the context of design workflows? And I think probably um, it would likely be evidenced by the array of people joining this call from, from say, from home and from office environments, um, that this hybrid model um, and one that's really fluid between a home work environment and a, a more office environment and be able to transition rapidly between those two um, is truly the new normal. And if you need to have that type of uh, accommodation, you also need to have a seamless capacity both for collaboration because your team may be together and may be disparate, um, but similarly, you also need to have a seamlessness in software functionality. The software that our customers are using needs to be able to work maybe on an underpowered uh, home computer. It may need to function in a virtual work environment. Um, it also may be able to or need to function in the context of, say, um, a desktop at the office. So the idea from, from the, uh, the trends that we're seeing is really about seamlessness. It's about ensuring that you have accommodation of all these disparate types of workflows um, and the ability to shift quickly between any one of them. And something that uh, really is driving, is really driving the uh, purchasing decisions for a lot of our customers actually has to come down to cost and, and frankly availability of hardware itself. You know, our, our Enscape software is one that is GPU intensive. 
Um, and that means that you have to have certain system requirements. And we're becoming more aware that uh, putting hard limits on those system requirements is a challenge when you have a uh, global supply chain issue um, and you have the, the cost of equipment being a major concern for a lot of our users. So when we look at the trends, uh, we want to build a degree of resilience um, into our software and the user experience that our, our uh, users have when it comes to hardware um, and uh, the associated requirements. So that's the, the really the trends that we see as driving um, our perspective of uh, what's going to be happening both in 2022 and as you can probably imagine with a lot of these um, going well beyond. So um, with that, I'd like to hand it over to John Kays, who will talk about this from the uh, perspective of um, students and what does this mean in the context of academia because obviously it's a very different environment with very different trends to consider. Thank you Roderick. Um, I think you know listening to your uh, presentation I was kind of remembering how I was looking at these trends um, in very much the same way. I think uh, a lot of the things that you're seeing we're seeing as well. Um, so I'm going to basically be giving a uh, uh, perspective from the point of view of an educator in a, a design uh, a college that uh, deals with uh, a, a range of design disciplines. We have a school of architecture and a school of art and design. And in that school of art and design, we have interior design, digital design, which is uh, entertainment and uh, uh, UI UX and uh, all the kinds of uh, uh, game and interactivity. Um, pieces as well as industrial design, product design. So we're looking at the same kinds of issues, um, maybe from a slightly different perspective because we have the added um, challenge of having to educate uh, students for uh, five years, 10 years into the future. So what are our bets that we're making? So one thing that we um, have been uh, doing for quite some time now is, um, is focusing on the built environment through virtual technology. So, um, you know, your first point about technology kind of driving this conversation, we've been doing this since 1985. Our first digital studio was, uh, we ran then. Uh, obviously, we didn't have the same hardware that you're seeing on the screen now, but this is um, a kind of a trend that we've been committed to for decades. And uh, we continue that, uh, those questions as to what is going to be next. And we do believe that the XR, um, space is going to uh, grow uh, and it's going to grow because of utility and what you can do with it. So I'm going to show you a little bit about um, what, what it is that we're uh, about and how our students produce work. So we are, um, are looking at virtual worlds, building virtual worlds. Um, we are uh, imagining the characters that would inhabit those virtual worlds. Sometimes they're fictional. Uh, and sometimes we're looking at it from a very practical kind of um, user experience or, or interface uh, perspective. Uh, but we are many times working at, at both of those things. So the environment as well as the character and especially in entertainment. So the slides I've shown you so far um, really deal with the kind of um, you know, asset creation development of uh, these super high uh, photorealistic uh, characters or uh, different assets that exist only in in the in the virtual world. Um, we have an array of different kinds of things that we we do with uh, different software. Uh, but what we're getting at uh, often is how we are making these compelling narratives, these compelling characters, uh, and I think more and more. Uh, the AEC firm has to do that as well. They have to create a compelling story for their clients to, to buy into. Uh, and the bar is, is rising now. Um, we are seeing exactly the kinds of things that, that I think most clients in, uh, in the AEC space are asking for more and more. They are used to seeing high, um, you know, high production value presentations. And so if you come in with a watercolor, you're probably not you know, coming in with uh, all you need. So what is it that, that, uh, that it takes to educate? What does it take to practice? 
Um, and I think this uh, this diagram kind of shows um, kind of what, what Broderick was talking about, the, the issues of, of things that we really care about that we have to think about, if that is um, that, that kind of seamlessness, uh, the hybrid kind of fluid environment, all of those things are, are concerns and considerations. And so um, when we're thinking about it, we're thinking about it in a very practical way. So what we have optimized for is performance and price, not so much that kind of fluid, um, lightweight versus heavyweight kind of transition. Uh, we just go for pretty heavy weight uh, GPU, heavy GPU um, uh, assumptions. So this is what our uh, our freshmen bought last uh, fall. So when they came in, they had to buy a um, uh, a machine that would basically handle all that we're going to throw it at, at them for either four or five years in their design education here. So um, you know you can imagine as we were <laughs> dealing with uh, um, supply chain <laughs> issues that this became a, a little bit of a, of a reach, but we are still committed to that. And this kind of shows you what it looks like when we deploy, oops, sorry, when we deploy that uh, in, in our studios. So you can see um, our, our interior designers here, for instance, are all querying what it is that they're designing, how are they seeing what they're seeing. And we also find that they catch a lot more uh, as they're learning to design, even at the sophomore level, um, with respect to detail, with respect to um, overall experience uh, of that uh, interior that they're, they're designing. So this is just a couple of, um, of examples of our sophomore uh, studios uh, output. So I'm going to show you a few of these. So not bad for sophomores, I'd say. Um, and again, the way that we're asking them to, to look at this is through a kind of um, virtual environment interface that is is built in Revit that is viewed through uh, through an Oculus Rift or um, another kind of VR headset, uh, and the the thing that ties these things together so importantly is Enscape is that in, Enscape uh, software interface. So one of the things that we are really scratching our heads about right now is can we continue this uh, this model? And we have, uh, we had a little taste of it last uh, September when a lot of our students were scrambling and we had to kind of play hardball with our with our vendor to honor the, the promise that they made and they had a, a really di difficult time. Uh, but um, I will say that, that they, they materially did come through on all their promises. Those same promises are not really forthcoming right now because uh, I think it uh, it's actually in some ways a little uh, deeper. The, the problem's deeper, and and it's it's not just because um, you know there's one boat stuck in the Suez Canal. Um, so looking at the the way that these these uh, lines are blurring more and more between um, the AEC and the entertainment industries, we're seeing more and more of that. Um, here are kind of, it's not so much the future, this is happening now. I mean, Unity and Autodesk have a very close um, partnership as to uh, Unreal Engine. Uh, these are game platforms or uh, entertainment platforms that are being used more and more in the, the production of, of architecture, uh, engineering and construction uh, industry uh, projects. The other thing that, that's curious uh, is that the the overall scale of each individual, you know, maybe large project is about the same. It's in, you know, measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And the timeline as well, it does kind of match up. Uh, and that really speaks to the kind of effort that it takes, whether you're building in the physical world or the, the virtual world. It still requires what it requires in order to, what I would say is, is produce the experience that we're expecting. What is that experience ultimately, whether it's virtual or real? And yes, there are different kinds of expectations and requirements, uh, you know, material and otherwise, but um, it still comes down to a successful project coming in on time on budget uh, using tools and techniques that will, will allow us to see what we need to see and make these decisions in a timely way. 
So again, this is kind of illustrating, these are things going on at our school at the same time. We're working with the same platforms, the same pro, uh, uh, hardware, many of the same software programs, uh, whether we're doing, you know, sort of uh, fantasy environments or uh, kind of uh, proposals for real spaces. Again, the, the, and the, the issue of character and narration that is more and more, I think, uh, one of the things that, that some of our, our students are looking at across disciplines. They're looking at it from, uh, from telling that story uh, and, and giving their presentation in a really compelling way. So one of the things I, I also want to talk about is the kind of ethical dimension of, of what we're tasked to, uh, to do here at, um, at NJIT. Uh, one of the things that we are committed to is, is uh, essentially building a, uh, a sustainable world. And so we know that uh, this, is, um, this has been a slow kind of um, uh, topic to integrate into practice. Uh, it's really difficult to get students to focus on, uh, say, metrics of things that they don't really understand because they're not chemists, they're, they're not um, you know, heavy, heavy uh, environmentalists, they don't know what even the units are. And so there's a lot of friction uh, in, in sort of figuring out how they can measure their environmental, uh, their environmental impacts on each of their design decisions as they're building a, a sort of an architectural or a design whole. So we do present them with different tools. We give them, um, you know, basic design software that they're using. But most of the time, what they're, what they are um, leaning toward, because Many of you are in the same position, I think. Uh, we got into this because we liked the way things looked, or we didn't like the way things looked, and we want to make them look better. So we, we're designers at heart, and we're not really, again, engineers, chemists, um, uh, economists, and we don't look at the world in, in those quantitative ways all the time as much as we might um, uh, wish we could. So what we're thinking, though, is as the metaverse, as these kinds of, of other immersive uh, interfaces and environments uh, are made more um, sophisticated and take into these kinds of, uh, of um, into consideration these kinds of things, we'll be able to deploy that to students who can look at their own projects, if even if it's an adaptive reuse project, turning it into a building that that uh, is uh, maybe more responsive to environmental impacts. And trying to figure out how we're going to get a uh, a kind of equivalency uh, between the model and the and the aesthetic portions of that and the analytical as we as we start start to lean on or um, try to figure out what those interfaces are going to be and those interfaces have not yet been designed so I think it's if we start to think just look at this as a case study of the, the tricky bit about this one thing that's really not the the most favorite thing for anybody to do because it takes us away from those aesthetic issues or programmatic issues um, we can start to bake in a lot of a lot more of those things because they will be available with no extra cost no extra time and very little effort but it really is going to come down to a kind of interface uh, conversation so as these tools continue to uh, to develop things like um, we're looking at uh, again heavy GPU uh, uh, requirements for NVIDIA's Omniverse, um, which allows us to collaborate better. Um, it allows us to to address these uh, these challenges that we have working across uh, boundaries, geographic boundaries, and in multidisciplinary uh, teams, uh, and just you know play people who are are flung uh, far and wide. And these workflows. That, that we come to expect really require quite a lot of, uh, of extra power. So I think one of the things we can all talk about a, a bit later is how do we do that? I mean, what does it look like when, we're, when we are you know, on underpowered laptops and trying to get to our model that we did, that we built in, a, uh, in something that is much more robust? I just wanna show you this. This is an ex example of uh, the Omniverse uh, project that we're looking at uh, from NVIDIA. And here you have three different screens, three different software packages. I think it's uh, Rhino, Revit, and Max. Um, and each of these um, uh, different programs 
are basically ingested um, and, uh, and kind of uh, put into one central model and everybody can work in their own, um, their own native uh, favorite software platform and the model will update in real time automatically. That's pretty, pretty interesting stuff when, when we're talking about kind of education uh, issues. And I think the way that students who we'd like to, um, we'd like to encourage them to look at multi-platform kinds of, of operation and be comfortable in different kinds of software, NURBS or polygonal modeling or, um, or database modeling. But usually they'll just grab onto one thing. The first thing they learn, that's their favorite thing, and they, they tend to revert to that. This allows us to maybe uh, short circuit that, that uh, unfortunate kind of practice or just real practice and, uh, and really expand the possibilities of uh, collaboration. Uh, with multiple players working with multiple different kinds of software. And you can see the kinds of, of um, industries that they're already in, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's uh, obviously the entertainment industry is big. If you look at the, at the, uh, the logos uh, that, that are, are representing who, who's playing together, uh, you have all uh, the big uh, software um, companies in, in the AEC space also playing with Epic Games and Pixar. So you can see this is the kind of, of marrying of these, these different kinds of, of technologies, different kinds of platforms, working uh, workflows and, uh, and tools. Um, so I, I also wanted to, to really make one point about um, the interface, where we could see some of this really come to, to bear, and that would be in just the material library and, and marrying geometric data with non-geometric data. Um, this is, oops, sorry, this is, this is the way, the, the engine that kind of drives it all. And it, for those of you who are not yet familiar with it, I would take a look at this in um, the USD language, the universal scene, des scene description that was developed by Pixar in order to ingest all of these different, it, different ways of working and um, coming up with a, with a workflow that is, is really um, productive and, uh, and also um, allows for a lot of different perspectives. So fundamentally, and I'll, I'll stop uh, here soon, what we're trying to do is uh, future-proof these students. And we know that they're going to need to have the skills, uh, not just of software and hardware, uh, but also to design. We're going to continue to develop um, our, our design programs to focus on narrative, on um, you know scene building, whether that is in the kind of a fantasy world or whether it's simulating a real kind of, uh, of uh, project uh, going forward. And we also realize that we need to tie, be oops, tie that between the real world and the virtual. We know that there is a connection. And the, and the metaverse for us is, uh, I think the most interesting part is where the, the physical world and virtual worlds interface and how they can move back and forth and, and potentially benefit uh, each other. So I'll end on this slide. This is, um, for those of you who saw the Super Bowl, I am not selling crypto. Um, this is an actual um, uh, symbol that you can click on with your, with your camera and uh, check it out. You'll see this very project done by a sophomore interior designer using uh, Revit and Enscape and looking at it th through their phones or through uh, the Oculus Rift uh, goggles that we use. So um, please feel free to, to click on that and uh, have a look at, around at the sophomore project. But we couldn't do this without, uh, without the, the uh, support of, of all of these technology companies and Enscape is one of our absolute favorites. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn this back over. Uh, Gemma, if you wanna Pull me back out. I'll stop sharing. Great, no problem. Right, just handing over to Modric, and then we can see the next slide. Okay. Uh, well, first, also, I, I want to say, uh, John, uh, it's really fantastic to see the amount of care and consideration that goes into uh, the students' education. 
Um, you know, this isn't a one-dimensional problem. Um, you know, it's not even a three-dimensional. I don't know how many dimensions you highlighted there, but I think that's the fascinating part there is that you have to balance so many competing variables to prepare these students for that workforce of tomorrow. Um, so I, I think that uh, the complexity of that challenge was really laid out and also the uh, the fantastic outcomes that your students have achieved. You know, those, those student work examples are really pretty, pretty stellar. Uh, so very impressive. Oh, thank you. I, and it's again, it's really um, something we couldn't do without uh, so many people supporting us. And I can say uh, I can express the gratitude that our students have as well. So it's a it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the future. Absolutely. Well, the nice thing, too, of course, is having you here. Um, you know, there's nothing better than knowing what the students want uh, because they're, of course, tomorrow's customers, um, simply put. Uh, so one of the questions people always ask is, how do we stay up to speed? And, and what's the, the mechanism by which we um, at Enscape stay up to speed? Um, and so this is one of the topics that we wanted to talk about and, and figure out how we actually track these trends. And one of the things that's important to remember is there's not one source um, for information. We actually have a, a multi-layered strategy for keeping up to date with what's happening. Um, so one of the things that we do is, is actually this is uh, pointed as having industry trend support. This is something that we produce internally on a monthly basis uh, that really looks at AEC, beyond. Uh, maybe it's looking at large-scale acquisitions that are happening, uh, perhaps key projects. You know, who won the Pritzker Prize this year? What do their projects look like? Uh, so things like that. Um, and that's one of the, the topics that we really like to do uh, deep dives on. Sometimes we'll, for each month, we might pick a, a particular topic. Maybe it's the metaverse. Maybe it's the uh, AI's Guide for Design Excellence. Um, and we'll do a deep dive on that and distribute that pretty thoroughly internally. Um, and that's one of the things that we use to help guide um, also our M&A thinking. So when Enscape is thinking about, say, maybe um, you know the next product uh, to integrate into our larger platform, you know those trends are, are certainly an important driver. Another important piece is our, our customer advisory board. We have a a lot of, of very um, influential users, I guess you could say, within the AC industry and beyond. Um, and their opinion um, is one in which we, we listen to very carefully. So we have a, a, a quite a small uh, customer advisory board, but one where I'd say it's absolutely outsized in its influence and experience. Um, and that's something, uh, once again, also that we lean on quite heavily. Um, and we're really excited about the level of engagement we have from that group. Uh, but the, while the customer advisory board is something that's thinking perhaps more on a strategic and long-term level, uh, we also have a power user group. Um, and these are people that really know how to push Enscape um, and are clamoring to get their hands on early releases um, and find ways in which maybe they're solving their problems or maybe ways in which the, the software might be falling flat. Um, and that power user group is incredibly valuable for really testing the software, uh, trying out new features, uh, determining whether or not something should be perhaps formally integrated into the product roadmap in the short term. Um, but those, that group is quite valuable and they feed really directly into um, our product team, helping determine uh, what exactly uh, is working on upcoming releases and what should be integrated into those releases. We also have a number of events, uh, both events that we attend, uh, maybe uh, the AIA National Convention, the Digital Built Week, uh, uh, Digital Construction Week, um, which we attended in the UK last year, uh, just as uh, some examples. Um, but we also host events ourselves, um, such as the Envision Conference last year, which was, which was quite successful. And with, through those events, uh, it's a fantastic way to well, honestly just directly engage with people in a really broad audience. Um, sometimes outside of our customer group, so you hear a diversity of opinions, um, and you can also hear people present perhaps um, on their experience with competitors tools. Um, so that's one of the ways in which we uh, we do find that uh, we can have an even greater degree of diversity and perhaps uh, break out of any sort of cognitive bias that we might be having um, through just sort of talking within our own ecosystem of users um, and interests. And then, of course, uh, we have webinars like this one. Uh, these types of webinars, you know, they're not only an opportunity for us to share information and, and engage with users, uh, but they're also an opportunity for us to challenge ourselves to generate new content, uh, to figure out uh, what information perhaps we want to share and use it as an impetus to engage in some research activity that may feed into um, support material, uh, might feed actually directly into the product itself. 
So these webinars are ones where, especially the uh, the two-way communication, you know, the feedback that we get from the webinars, um, as well as, of course, us generating the content itself, um, are enormously valuable. We also have a blog um, that's pretty lively. We have topics that range from perhaps the highly technical um, to ones that are perhaps um, you know, a little bit more about uh, general applications to maybe a new workflow or a new industry. Uh, but all those blog posts are written by someone. They incorporate a degree of research, customer outreach, uh, but they're a really great way for us to not only get support material out there, but also for us to research those new topics and to generate content that uh, ends up being pretty valuable for us to understand what the needs are of our users and, of course, the, the critical needs of the industry as a whole. And then the last piece, uh, which perhaps may be one of the more important one, is our forum. Uh, the Enscape forum is a lively place, to say the least. Um, there's you know, showcase projects being posted, um, Q&As about particular problems that might be happening. Um, it's really a, a fantastic first stop for people to, to engage with the larger Enscape community, whether they have issues or they want to talk about a success that they might have had. And that forum is definitely closely monitored um, and information of all sorts is gleaned from it and utilized to determine maybe what features that we should be uh, pursuing, features that we might want to deprecate, um, and maybe support issues that uh, we weren't aware of but are starting to pop up in the forum first before we hear about it elsewhere. Um, and then I think uh, along the bottom there, uh, just to highlight our, our customer experience team and really the, the support that we offer, you know, they're the one of the frontline uh, people when it comes to issues that our customers might have. So listening carefully to those customers um, and, of course, resolving their issues on an individual basis, but also using the information that comes in through support to guide larger scale product um, development initiatives um, is hugely valuable. So. Um, when you think about the overall ecosystem uh, that we deploy when it comes to staying up to speed and looking at trends, both large and small, I think this gives you a little bit of a peek on all of the, the different components that we try to um, take into consideration when we think of what are the trends that are, are driving Enscape. You know, this is, um, this is pretty much mirrored in how we also look at, at what we're trying to do as well. We ask, industry what they need we uh we would like to know what our students believe is important um and what uh how that how they perceive the value of their education uh if they don't see that and if they can't if we can't demonstrate that they can go out and and work uh you know in a in a very um you know um in a way that is uh helpful to them and that adds value uh, then we're barking up the wrong tree. So um, we hope that we're getting the right um, information, that we're not in an echo chamber. Uh, we're, we try to get this broad-based perspective as well. And I think one of the, the components that's always been interesting to me when it comes to um, students in particular is that that's a, a bit of a moving target. You know, what students need, they're coming in with um, perhaps no knowledge um, in a sense of, of you know, what the, what the industry or maybe a more limited amount of, of knowledge about the industry. Um, but as they spend time at the school, their knowledge um, uh, of the industry actually grows quite a bit. And there's a certain vitality, I would say, almost that comes with students um, that is, is difficult to capture um, and, and it's difficult to find elsewhere. And I'm wondering if there's a mechanism within NGIIT where you are able to use the students themselves as a mechanism of understanding trends um, and, and developing uh, even uh, curriculum that, that meets those trends that are originating from the students. You know, um, one of the, the things that it's, it's difficult to stay on the bleeding edge of is um, preferences for uh, platform as far as, uh, especially in the gaming platform, I'd say that one is the fastest moving target, uh, much more than say our interiors or our architecture students. Um, the, that's why I think it's really helpful to follow gaming, uh, to follow the entertainment space because it moves a bit faster. And I th but I do think it's a leading indicator to what we're going to need in the in these other disciplines as well. So uh, one of the great places that that uh, we go to to see what's going on in that industry is uh, uh, SIGGRAPH, uh, which is uh, 
it's a part of uh, the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, so ACM SIGGRAPH is, is, a, is a really valuable place to see what those trends are going to be from both the industry, from, uh, from the technical side, from the artistic side, and also from the student side. And so listening to what's going on, not just in our school, but across the nation and across the world, uh, whether that's SIGGRAPH Asia or, um, or our own uh, conference in the, in the United States, that's super valuable to see exactly what's coming uh, ahead. Usually they lead it, they lead that kind of conversation by about five years, maybe 10 years. So it's, it's very, very helpful for us to see that as well. Which is nice. It's uh, the fact that you probably think on a, a time horizon that actually may be further out than ours in some respects, uh, because you know, yeah, the education, you, know, you have to prepare these students for tomorrow. There's no point in teaching them skills that are going to be antiquated by the time they graduate. Yeah, if we don't lead that, I mean, we everything's a bet, right? So we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the likelihood that this is going to happen? Um, we've been, we've had a very good track record when we bet on technology. And so really asking the, the fundamental question about, well, where's the technology going? That's, uh, that's an easy bet. The more difficult one is to, um, to think about the ethical implications of how we deploy that, that, um, that technology or how we approach design. Uh, what are the, the other drivers that really maybe not directly uh, related to, te to technology, but technology still either accelerates or it, it inhibits or it does something to it. So looking at that more complex um, uh, world where these things kind of come together, it's, um, it's an interesting kind of conversation. And then there's all the logistics and the kinds of, well, we think this is going to happen. Now, how do we respond to that? You know, we talked about the global supply chain. That's gonna be a real issue. That's a, a fundamental thing. Is it existential? No, because we can still teach design even if we're, you know, using. Yeah, the, the fundamentals are consistent, but the, the tools do matter quite a bit. Absolutely do matter, yes. I mean, if we didn't do that, then we, I, I mean, we still, we have a, say, a hand drawing class. It's absolutely important. Dr drawing, not drafting, but going out, looking, seeing, drawing. That is something that I think has been around for a long time, and it's going to be around for a long time to come. But that is not sufficient to educate today's designer. Yes, you can teach somebody how to draw, but their I think their their job prospects would be extremely limited uh, if we didn't give them access to the very best technology that we have access to. Yeah, it has to be just one arrow uh, of a larger quiver, um, so to speak. For sure. So something else, though, uh, that we wanted to touch on was, and you mentioned um, in your talk, was this idea of architecture um, and entertainment and that really the confluence of the two. And a lot of it comes down to, to communication uh, and engaging clients in a way that they're expecting these days. And we have the, the recent merger with Enscape and Chaos. I think it really hammered home um, how serious we are taking that particular integration of entertainment and architecture. Um, and one of the things that's fascinating is that, as you noted in your presentation, you know, this is already happening to some degree. Um, you're seeing situations here where movies uh, themselves actually have a, a remarkable degree of architecture within them. So not only are architecture firms finding out that a more entertainment or cinematic approach to communication is really essential, um, but at the same time, you're also seeing remarkable architecture being produced, as you noted, by the same tools within the context of um, uh, within the context of uh, entertainment itself. So this is, a, I say, a, a video um, showing some of that that intersection between the two. And I think it's important for us to remember that you know architecture in and of itself doesn't always have to be about these virtual worlds but uh, this confluence of entertainment is a fascinating one and maybe a question i'll throw out to you but as i've been thinking about it myself is when i see these remarkable virtual worlds that are being generated and there's whole movies where essentially all of the all of it takes place within a virtual world you know, what are your thoughts on on the opportunity for architecture to have a play within that and, and why hasn't architecture firms been involved in this because you look at these these designs you're thinking well you know, I'm sure Zaha Hadid's office could do something like this. Um, so why isn't that happening in your in your thinking? Mm, well, 
I have a feeling it has to, and just this is what I note in looking at the different disciplines in my own college. And uh, part of what I think architects focus on it, as a discipline is sort of the programmatic and the sculptural, right? So there's kind of formal and programmatic issues, but up Yeah, to, there's an element of practicality, right? That has to, to come into play. Practicality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and the, the fact that they, that they don't go all the way. It's formal, but not not experiential necessarily, the way that a motion picture would be. So the issue of color, in many cases, is um, is diminished, right? So some people have called, you know, a few of my colleagues chromophobic. Um, where it, in the entertainment industry, that would be that wouldn't be helpful. So the I think it has to do with our our preferences, the way we lean, and how we like to practice, and what we're really interested, what subset of things that we're really interested in. Could be the practical, could be the structural, could be the uh, constructional, it could be the kind of just the, the kind of fetishistic um, uh, focus of connection uh, in, in, you know, in materials, and, and those are great, like I understand, because I, I went through it, I'm an architect myself, um, so I get it. But to, then to look at it in con to contrast it with the entertainment industry, there's a, another layer of, of kind of you could say superficial uh, experience that you have to really focus on. Not so much uh, how it goes together, but how it really really looks. How how the frame will look. How will how will that two minutes of of film be? What will that what will that experience uh, bring up emotionally in you? And what is the relationship between the specific narrative, which is really well scripted, and um, and the assets that are being created. So I think they're 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 different different foci. Uh, that that sure, there's different that. there's different focuses. But I would almost say that if you look at some of the work of the best architects that are out there, those that have really captured people's imagination, um, it's quite possible that they labored over the details to the same degree. You know, they, they wanted to create an emotional response uh, for people that are occupying these spaces and, and they saw the, the assemblage of these um, very um, uh, very developed details this high level of concentration um, in design as being one of the the key mechanism for achieving that particular outcome but there there always does seem to be um, an anchoring in in that physical reality uh, this is a space that you're going to occupy you know it's going to keep a uh, water off or, or water off your head, hopefully, maybe some of the time. Um, you know, it's gonna protect the health, safety, and welfare of the occupants. You know, there's there's these fundamental differences. But I do wonder as we look forward, is that is that going to start to erode? Um, are our architects going to start to think of themselves as having an opportunity that might go someplace else? Um, and part of it is looking at what's out there right now. Um, looking at this, you know, this first M NFT house that was put together or this um, one Sotheby uh, metaverse house that's being done with Foxhall Architects and, and looking at these and saying, you know, there might be an opportunity for um, some of the great work I see by Enscape users to uh, maybe assert itself, given uh, this as the, the current example of the, of the state of the art. So you and I both have uh, young children and I think you have to ask them what are you building in roblox right now and i think if you look at the kinds of of you know the way blocksburg is being developed uh and the currency that is being used i mean there there are what a robux i think they're called uh where you can buy different things so it's it's really well funny. familiar with these yes exactly so if you start to think about that for that generation and imagine where you know if moore's law holds where they're going to kind of interface with this kind of metaverse as they reach the age of, of the creators and going to school, becoming designers themselves and looking at these opportunities. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, with the tools that they will have at their disposal. What are they used to? How do they interface? Now we, we grew up learning. I mean, I actually grew up first learning how to draft on a drafting table. So I'm in that generation that has seen both sides of this thing. I've seen the the kind of analog production, and I've seen you know through AutoCAD, DOS, through AutoCAD in a in a much more sophisticated way, 2D, 3D, Revit, all the kinds of things, that, and now finally 
these these other platforms that, that we've been discussing today that are expanding and blending these kinds of, of possibilities. So I think that the the tool user will have a lot to, to say about which industries they're going to get into and how comfortable they're going to be working across the kind of disciplinary uh, boundaries that are currently uh, holding today. I think those boundaries will start to erode very quickly as people see opportunities and they can see creative, uh, creativity is creativity, whether it exists in the virtual world or in the physical world. And I, and I hesitate to use the world real as, uh, as, a, as an oppositional term to virtual because the virtual is real. And, and that's the kind of, I think, uh, the discussion about the metaverse. The metaverse really has this, this real um, presence and it will, I be, think, become more and more real. Uh, and we are, we are already inhabiting that. But as far as production and what the indus industrial opportunities are, I think it, it really goes to the user. And I think that is going to expand much more as we go. I think that's a, a absolutely a valid point. And um, I always like to use the term physical world, uh, perhaps as a, as a way of uh, anchoring one versus the the virtual, yep. in some uh, maybe one one way of doing that. But something else I've noticed actually to hit on one of your point about uh, essentially a culture um, that is reflective of, of different um, categories of, uh, based on the technology you've experienced. I remember during uh, when school was remote and one of my children said that uh, they're going to go to school today or they're at, like, oh, I have to go to school now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a second, is school back in session? Um, and I was still anchored in the idea that school would be in the physical place. But for them, um, school, whether it was online or in person, um, it's the same. And it was a, an interesting way of seeing how their perception has shifted. So perhaps we'll see that in the same context of design, um, where an architect won't always have to feel that their their projects and have to end up with a, on a construction site, you know, and, and uh, concrete being poured. Um, maybe there's a different process and a different outcome, but it's the same thing. It's still architecture, and it's still a place that's being experienced by people. Agreed. Absolutely. I don't know if we have any. Do we have any questions yet, or? Uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you know, Gemma, we can maybe do the questions at the end, um, or if there's some really good ones that popped up, um, feel free to interject. Otherwise, um, I was thinking we could uh, touch on uh, sort of educational reach and and the role of education, um, at least for us. Well, we're, we're we're part of that big circle right in the on the on the left side of. That. Of your chart, so absolutely you are, yeah. And and I think what's interesting about this, yeah, and uh, perhaps when it comes to these types of trends, and when you mentioned SIGGRAPH as well, is that we're it's truly international now. Um, a, a software that's being developed uh, really has to have an audience that's that's global in mind, um, and that global audience will be one that is going to have different levels of um, obviously, you know, there's going to be different types of design. Uh, methodologies and workflows, different types of hardware access, um, internet access. So it's not just a matter of having students um, all over the place and maybe having to make sure you have support that covers a variety of time zones, um, but it's really about having a software that works within um, all these various contexts. But I think what's also uh, really just beautiful about this is that design is truly global and universal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's something that, that matters everywhere. Um, and I also wanted to call out some of our, our larger um, uh, users out there. You can see NJIT uh, near the top of the list. But when you think of all these floating licenses that are installed and, and uh, at these various universities and it's being used, you know, just the amount of creativity that's being unleashed via Enscape is incredibly exciting for us. And um, you, you were talking about the idea that you know, students are coming in perhaps a little less inhibited um, by the realities of, of uh, say, architecture. And one of the things I love to see is the student work that gets submitted to Enscape um, because, um, you know, the, uh, the structural engineer, we got, never got to look at those drawings. Um, you know, they're pretty outlandish, and I, I absolutely love that. Um, there, there's a need for that type of thinking because um, there's always something beautiful about making the, uh, as our uh, CEO, Christian Lang, likes to say, the uh, improbable possible. And I feel that the student work is oftentimes highly improbable. Um, and I love to imagine if it was possible. Amen, brother. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we, uh, as I said before, we are really uh, very, very uh, fortunate. In fact, every school on that list is very fortunate to have uh, such a, a wide variety of things to choose from 
And again, especially in the, in today's context, um, where we are looking for ways to kind of bring some of them together. And these uh, these technologies like Enscape allows us to uh, to imagine what it is to collaborate uh, with each other in in this one this one kind of virtual space and uh, and bring a lot of those those kinds of ideas and that energy uh, to bear on the, on those projects. So it really does matter uh, the platform and the specifics in software and hardware. I think. Absolutely. Um, so we actually have some questions in the audience. Um, you know, if uh, I, I just pull in from yeah, Gemma, are there some that you think uh, we have time to address? Yeah, I, I'd quite like to take this one here, which I think is referring to the metaverse. Um, so this is from Tyler. Architects may be perhaps the most qualified to conceptualize meaningful human environments in the, di in the digital realm uh, because of their experience and education with real-world construction. Uh, but architects seem to be behind in VR or digital design compared to, say, game designers or movie artists. So he was wondering how do architects bridge the gap and make the case that they are actually quite uniquely suited for this kind of design. Any thoughts on that? Well, I can say that our digital design program started when we noticed that a lot of our architecture students were going into motion picture uh, production. They, they were being recruited because of those skill sets. And I would say, uh, lead with your strengths and say, you know, when you are, are going to uh, propose something to, uh, say, in, uh, an enter the entertainment industry, you can show something that is that is really uh, has a depth that uh, maybe somebody who's not fully educated in architecture or design uh, can can bring to that that project. Uh, usually has to do with understanding of say say structural veracity of historic um, deeper say history of architecture. Um, understanding of context. An architecture education is an amazing education because it's so thorough and so broad. Um, so I would remember back if you are, a, you know, a recent grad or you've been out some time. Remember back to what you learned and and differentiate yourself in that conversation based on those specific uh, educational skills and knowledge that you have. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, let's see if we can take a couple more. Uh, so one here, what are you seeing as trends and what is Enscape and NJIT working on to close the data drop between virtual reality and construction and physical reality and construction? Well, I have my own hobby horse, uh, but I'm going to let Roderick take this. Well, I, I'd be curious to, see, to know exactly what they're thinking of, you know, VR and construction. Um, you know, if we're thinking about this just sort of from a, a very uh, brass tax perspective, you know, VR and construction is actually a pretty challenging one. One of the things that we found in reaching out to, to people directly involved in construction is that workplace safety is of absolute paramount concern. Um, and as you start to bring in different ways of uh, it's almost removing a person from the the, uh, the work environment itself of, con of a construction site, uh, there's a lot of risk involved with that uh, for falls, people stepping into holes and things like that. Um, so we're really interested to see people that are trying to navigate the inner um, the the challenge of bringing more data to the construction site, which can be highly valuable, but do so in a way that uh, doesn't necessarily uh, bring with it additional risk. Um, and so a couple of, of things that I think have caught our attention. One of them is um, an example from a friend of Enscape's called Kohlbecker Architects out of Germany, which does a lot of the um, designs um, for uh, the manufacturing facilities for say like the VW group. And one example of what they're doing is they're using Boston Dynamics robot that does essentially a reality capture throughout a construction site um, and then syncs that and meshes that with um, the BIM model itself. Um, and essentially using that as a mechanism of uh, construction administration, um, which is our, from our perspective is a really interesting way of starting to bring together uh, disparate forms of technology in a way that's safe and efficient um, and useful for both the uh, the client and the architect. Um, so I think that's one of the, maybe an example of ways in which you sort of you balance the, these competing issues of trying to bring more data into the construction site, but also maintaining safety. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers the question, but um, I would add one other thing to that, and that is uh, looking at the full range of XR technologies 
uh, you know, you don't want to go in with, with full on VR goggles uh, when you don't know where you're stepping. But AR can actually be a really great way to do kind of these spot checks to look for uh, uh, any any differences between the digital twin and the actual physical um, uh, reality built. So, I yeah, there's the, uh, an outfit called Argyle, which is doing an interesting um, effort uh, where they are bringing almost a wireframe of the building. Um, so the idea is that it doesn't fully occlude and you really still see the reality through it. Um, so I would say it's a very light um, augmentation as, as their mechanism of doing that. Wonderful. Right, well, can we take just one very last question, if we can answer this one fairly quickly, because we're at the top of the hour already. Um, William has asked, I was wondering if Roderick has any advice on how a small firm um, could get into VR and the metaverse. Absolutely. Um, I think the metaverse one is an interesting one because it's, it's really, it's wide open, but it's also about um, creating those virtual environments. If I were to really start to think about it, I would think about it in a, in a more compartmentalized way and think about ways in which you could provide a, uh, a meta version, if you will, or an immersive um, version of the projects that you're already delivering for your clients. Um, these are ones that they can really, um, say, occupy and engage with uh, from a digital sense um, and maybe even allow for other people to, to engage with them in that virtual environment, say, you know, using some type of these um, online collaborative tools. So that's maybe a, a fairly compartmentalized way of doing that. And then when, honestly, when it comes to VR, um, you know, I have to really push Enscape from that perspective. A lot of our customers come to us because they want that one button VR solution. Um, and that's something that we can deliver. So it's one of the ways in which we feel that um, we really can provide a benefit, especially to those small firms that may find, say, going into like a Unity workflow or something like that, just frankly too complex uh, for them to, to potentially do. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I think we will wrap things up. We have just passed the top of the hour. So Thank you, Roderick. Thank you, John, so much for your presentations, for the discussion and answering a few of those questions from the audience. Really fantastic presentation. Had lots of great feedback as well uh, from the audience. So thank you so much for the time involved in preparing for today and the, for talking to us. Um, our to pleasure. the audience, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Um, and yes, to our audience, thank you for obviously spending the last hour with us. Um, we will send an email with the recording to you shortly and some extra resources. And a little survey will pop up uh, when you need the webinar as well, and we'd really appreciate your feedback, help us improve these sessions for next time. So if you could take a moment to fill that out, we would very much appreciate it. So with that, uh, thank you again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and hope you can join us for another webinar soon. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.